Hi, welcome to Fostering Resilience. My name is KJ Foster, and in today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you information about the role that the grieving process plays in recovery from addiction. It's a role that a lot of people are not aware of in terms of just how significant it is in recovery from addiction. So in today's video, I'm going to share with you information about how it impacts not only the individual moving through the recovery process, but the family members of that individual with the substance use disorder, addiction, how it impacts the family members as well. So if you're brand new to my channel, I create videos that are all about addiction recovery to help both individuals and family members to be successful in recovery from addiction. So if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, definitely click on that red subscribe now button below. And when the bell pops up, if you click on the bell, you will be alerted to all of my upcoming videos. I post educational videos every Monday. So go ahead and click that subscribe now button and let's get started. In this video today, I'm sharing with you a PowerPoint of information that I share with individuals and their family members who are in treatment for substance use disorders. So the family members aren't in treatment per se, although they, they come in as a part of the treatment program, as a part of the family program, and they learn all of this information that is really uh, important to know in order to maintain a successful recovery and information about this grieving process that both the individual and the family members and or loved ones, you know, I use the word family member, but that refers to any loved one who's in a relationship with someone who is recovering from a substance use disorder, recovering from addiction, that that really need, they need to know um, about this, this process. Because oftentimes, you know, people think of grief relative to losing, um, the death of a loved one. Uh, but the grieving process can come into play relative to the loss of, of many other things in our lives. So the, the individual who's in recovery from addiction, along with their loved ones, their family members, usually don't consider the significance and the strong role that this grieving process plays in the experience, in the recovery from addiction. And the experience of, of grief is not only stimulated by, by death, by losing a loved one or possessions, but grief is also engaged when someone loses a way of living or a way of looking at themselves, which has been a way of life. And so this can this can um, be a part of losing a job, um, losing a relationship. And also, as you're going to, to see as we move through this, this PowerPoint presentation, uh, it, it is stimulated by the loss of this way of life, this relationship with the substance. So the individual recovering from addiction will experience a, a death of sorts, a death of an old self. So the loss of the relationship with their drug of choice is very significant. And it's a death of an old way of living and an old way of being. But the good news is that you, they, whoever you're watching this for, whether it's for yourself or for a loved one, will also experience a rebirth of a new self that is ultimately far stronger, healthier, and more powerful than the old self ever was. So this, this transition is painful. And it's a transition that will be painful for both the individual and their loved ones. So both you and your loved one, again, whoever you're watching this for, will experience a grieving process as a result of of this loss as a re I mean, I say loss, it's actually a gain, but there's a lot of losses that take place. There's a lot of change that takes place before we see and experience all of the gains and all of the, the gifts and all of the positive benefits that recovery truly does bring. So as you, um, 
or your loved one embark on this path of recovery and this new way of living, grief emerges in reaction to the intense changes that are taking place. And understanding and accepting this process of grieving helps recovery to be less of a mystery for you or your loved one. And the whole family is is in recovery. And I know that this is a hard concept for some people to, to recognize or to even accept, but it's absolutely the truth. The entire family is in recovery and will experience the grieving process. So, so what is grief? Grief is a lot more than than people generally understand because it has it's multifaceted it's an emotional mental social spiritual and physical response to loss so all of these different domains are affected by the grieving process let's look at some of the losses that are experienced by the person the addicted person. So the person, and I'm talking about here, I'm not talking about an active addiction. You know, there are plenty of losses that are experienced while the individual is in active addiction. And some of these cross over into the recovery process, obviously, but there's also these losses that are experienced as a result of recovery. And so some of these losses are the loss, obviously, of the addiction itself. And I say obviously, but you know, this is something that I didn't consider when I was in early recovery, but it actually um, truly is this grieving process of the loss of the substance, the loss of the behavior, the loss of rituals associated with the, the, the drug or the alcohol or both that had been, um, that had been a relationship, you know, I had a relationship with alcohol for many, many years. And so the loss of that relationship that I had with that substance, that comfort, um, that solution, it was, it was my comfort and it was my solution for many, many years. So the loss of that relationship, the loss of other relationships in our lives, you know, the loss of certain friendships, certain people that are a risk to our recovery that we are, you know, we lose that at least, uh, you know, many four will lose permanently, but there are others who may just, uh, need to, um, be kind of kept at arm's length for a period of time. So it's not like there are some relationships that we won't lose altogether, but and there's some that we need to lose completely, but there are others where you just meet, might need to stay away from those individuals for, for a period of time. Then there's, you know, health issues. We lose, um, we lose our health in, in a lot of cases. We lose our integrity. We lose self-esteem. Often we lose jobs. We lose freedom, self-respect, trust, money, lifestyle, hobbies, and much more. So this is not an all-inclusive list. This is just a number of different losses that are experienced by the person who is recovering from the addiction. And these, as you can see, are substantial. It's their substantial losses. Now let's look at the losses experienced by the family members. And this is an area, again, where a lot of people don't consider just how huge of an impact this can have on certain loved ones and and family members so the loss of the addiction itself the loss of the substance or the behavior can be huge for other family members and friends because depending upon your own use of substances this may or may not be an issue for you and other family members but i've seen many many times where this is um, an issue. And so, for example, if your spouse, um, you know, because of their addiction, no longer drinks, and you're somebody who drinks, this can be a loss, a loss of that connection that you have with your loved one in that drinking activity. And so for me, this is something that I definitely identify with because I, I experienced this significant loss of connection with my family because my family, large Irish Catholic family, everybody drinks. It's a way that we connect with each other. And I and my family members have experienced a significant loss um, as a result of the fact that I no longer drink. 
And so again, depending upon your own use of substances, this may or may not be an issue for you. There's also the relationship role. And this, um, this can be represented in a couple of different ways. So one way is, you know, oftentimes when an individual is in active addiction, it affects their ability to, um, to take, you know, to fulfill certain responsibilities. So say, you know, your partner is struggling with, um, with addiction. And as a result of their addiction, you took over the finances or you took over taking care of the kids or, you know, different roles that you take on in your relationship, you assumed their role. Well, what happens is that as your loved one starts to recover and they get to a point where then they're capable of, and they're wanting to resume that role, oftentimes because the partner has taken it on and, um, has been doing it for a period of time, they're reluctant to give it up and they don't want to then give it back. So that can be an issue. And also, um, you know, oftentimes the, the person with the addiction can become the scapegoat in the family for everybody else's problems. And so, you know, as the person recovers and they become healthier, then they, their, their role in the family changes. And it's often, um, the, because of the dynamics, the way families work, it's often a struggle to allow that individual to be released from that role in the family. And that often other family members without even really being conscious of it, will try to keep that individual in that role as the black sheep, as the scapegoat. And so that can be a challenge for the family. Also like the change in lifestyle impacts family members. And it says here unhappiness, you know, a lot of times family members, spouses, children, parents, whomever will blame their own unhappiness on the person with the addiction. And as the person with the addiction becomes healthy, becomes recovered, um, and changes, then they no longer have that scapegoat again, that person to blame their own unhappiness on. So that can be challenging. Also the, the addicted person, believe it or not, uh, sometimes has a tendency to be more predictable and even more manageable when they're in active addiction. And so even though like it's unhealthy and dysfunctional, it's often predictable. And so as that person changes and becomes healthier, they can become more unpredictable. And also they can start to exert their own opinions and influence that maybe, you know, the family member of the loved one doesn't really like, and they, you know, I know it's hard to believe, but I see it happen. I actually have heard family members say that they liked the person better when they were, when they were drinking and or drugging because they were controllable because that family member, that person had power over them. And so they, often time try to, uh, it's not like they're even, again, it's not like it's even conscious, but sometimes it is conscious. It's, you know what? I prefer that person drinking. They're, they're easier to manage. They're, they're more predictable. I have more control. And as hard as that is to believe, I see it happen. And then there's the time that's taken away from the family with the recovery program. So whatever recovery program you're involved with, um, it takes time and there you go to meetings and you're, you're meeting with your support group and you're making phone calls and you're, you're doing things that are important for you to maintain your recovery. But often the family members struggle with feeling left out and not feeling a part of, and this is why it's important for all family members to be involved in their own recovery program and their own recovery process. And this is not a, just like the previous list, this is not everything. This is not all inclusive, but this is many of the common losses that are also experienced by loved ones and family members. On this slide, I have the five stages of grief by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross that are depicted. And we have here denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I'm going to go into a little more detail relative to each one and how it impacts both the individual you know, with the substance use disorder and the family members. And, you know, when I talk about this in treatment, I talk about how 
um, most people in treatment can think about where they were just prior to entering into treatment and this whole cycle that takes place of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And it is, um, it is, it's, something that you don't go through just once, you know, it's not this like process of, oh, you get to acceptance and boom, you're, you know, you're there and you stay there. Um, Oftentimes, because um, addiction is a chronically relapsing disorder, people can go from acceptance back into denial, like in a heartbeat. And I can tell you from my own experience that I did that over and over and over again, before I was really able to stay within that area of um, accepting the circumstances, accepting that, you know, I I really um, choose not to pick up a drink or a jug because I, I realize that I can't guarantee what is going to happen should I do that. So I accept the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm somebody that does, that chooses not to drink. It's taken me a long time to get there, to get to the point where I've gone from I can't drink to this place of I choose not to drink. And and there's a definite shift in mindset when you can go from that place of I can't to I just don't and I choose not to. Now let's look at each stage um, individually. So stage one denial, this is the earliest stage of the grief process that occurs when someone has not yet fully comprehended or been able to integrate the depth of the change in their lives. And before I move on, I just want to um, say one more thing about the the grieving process. And that is that, you know, the grieving process can be um, stimulated by a number of different things throughout your recovery process. So again, it's not something that you go through just once. You can go through it over and over again, and you can go through it relative to different losses that are experienced as you move through the recovery process. So just being aware of, as we go through these stages, thinking about where you are um, in that process of grieving. So here we have stage one denial. So what does that look like relative to the person with the with the addiction? And the, the addicted individual will utilize denial to avoid taking responsibility. And often, even into recovery, this, this can happen. So the, the individual can still be in a significant amount of denial, even in, you know, throughout the recovery process. So just because somebody decides to take responsibility for their addiction may not mean that they're willing to take responsibility for other areas of their life, of their life. So um, denial is, is avoiding taking responsibility for um, their substance use or other types of behavioral acting out. And the addicted individual in denial will blame other people and circumstances for their problems. So again, like you can be in the recovery process and still be blaming other people and circumstances. Family members who are in denial, spouses, loved ones, family members in this stage will avoid drawing logical conclusions about the addicted person's problems. So they may even try to cover it up or make excuses for their loved one's behavior, sometimes even blaming themselves rather than being able to see the issues for what they really are. In this next slide, there's this depiction here of the different types of denial. And so I like to just go through this quickly because denial comes in many forms. You know, denial, there's avoidance denial where you just avoid, you avoid talking about it. It's the elephant in the room. You avoid doing anything about it. You avoid um, talking about it, taking action. So that in and of itself is a form of denial. Then there's the absolute denial. This is the, there's absolutely nothing wrong. There's, you know, nobody has a problem here and there's an absolute refusal to even acknowledge that there, there's any type of an issue going on. Then there's minimizing there's, well, it's really not that bad. And, you know, for the addicted person, it's, uh, I really didn't use that much or, you know, for the family member, it's, you know, 
saying minimizing the impact on the family, minimizing the use of the loved one. There's rationalizing, which is making excuses for the behavior, making excuses um, for the addiction. Then they're blaming, blaming other people. It's not my fault. It's the job. It's, you know, my spouse. It's, oh, my, my, uh, whatever it is, my health or the loss of something. It's the gr the grief itself, you know, like if you had somebody die or you lost a job, it's blaming those circumstances. Then there's comparing. And this is very common, you know, for people who enter into 12-step recovery, they do what I call, they compare out. And I did this for many years as I would go in and I would listen to other people's stories, other people's experiences. And I would say, I'm not as bad as they are, you know, so I'm then using that as an excuse to, to um, convince myself that I don't have a problem because I can't have a problem because I'm not even, you know, as close to this other person and their problems and their issues. So comparing yourself to other individuals, manipulating, manipulating is where, you know, you, you say to yourself, oh, okay, I'm going to do X pur purposefully to get the other person to do Y. So manipulating family members into giving you money, or if you're the, the, the family, family member, you're manipulating the, your, your loved one to try and get them to take responsibility for their addiction. So you're, you're manipulate instead of using direct communication, you're trying to manipulate the person to do what you want them to do. And then this is my favorite, um, only because I laugh. Um, whenever I laugh in videos, by the way, I'm laughing because I'm laughing at myself because it reminds me of the things that I did. And this flight into health was one that I did many, many times. And that's where we go from, you know, from being, addicted to I'm never ever ever gonna drink or drug again I'm not like we have this unrealistic flight into health we think we don't um we don't have a healthy respect for the power of the illness for the power of the disease it's it's f going from black to white you know from okay I have this problem to nope not anymore I'm done I'm finished I don't need any help because I'm done and I'm never going to drink again I'm never going to use that drug of choice again and and we go from one extreme to the other and when we do that like I said we don't have a realistic respect and understanding for the power of the illness and we put ourselves at high risk for relapse so that's something to be very much aware of okay stage two anger the anger stage of grief exists as an attempt to avoid the true underlying addictive problems. So by using anger, blaming, nagging, shaming, the addicted person, the loved one, um, can seemingly throw around responsibility for personal, family, financial, legal, and other problems without identifying and acknowledging the addiction problem itself. And this is done by family members and by the person addicted they can use this this anger um so how it how it represents with the addicted person is that the addicted person will conclude that it's everybody else's fault you know it's it's the fault of their partner job children etc that causes them to use or act out so it's a way of just um you know taking their their issue and um, projecting it on to other people and it's everybody else's fault and it's a way of not accepting responsibility so fam for family members in the anger phase okay this is the anger phase of the grieving process they'll vent their anger on usually like everybody else but the addicted person sometimes it may be on their loved one who's addicted but sometimes it may be friends and work and and recreation time and and they'll attempt to use control and complaining and negativity to tolerate their own unhappiness, all the while being angry with themselves for the way that they're acting. Stage three. Stage three is the bargaining stage. And in this stage of grief, the person is beginning to come to some realization that there is or might be a problem. But to compensate, they're working hard to try to continue 
um, to avoid fully facing the solution or reality of their circumstances. So to bargain is to try to maintain control and continue to live without any real change taking place. So for the addicted person who's in the bargaining stage, this is the stage where it's just give me one more chance and I promise I will never kinds of statements rather than being fully surrendered to the depth of the problem and family members in the bargaining stage may accept these promises even though they know that they know deep down inside that their loved one is not going to be able to keep the the promises but um but they're they're just you know hoping and praying that by accepting the promises that the change will occur and they may even do things like try to make their loved one's life easier by giving them money by you know by helping them in ways that are actually hurting them because it's allowing them to continue to use but they have this false hope that by doing that it's going to help their loved one to stop their addictive behavior and stage four depression this stage marks the beginning of the true surrender to the depth and the meaning of the addictive problem. So for the addicted, this means that they're no longer trying to assign blame or find a way out, and they're beginning to delve into the sadness and the fear of not knowing themselves as they thought they did. For family members and depression, um, this is where the family members, just like the the person who is recovering from the addiction, they start to begin to comprehend the depth of the losses and the challenges that the addiction has cost. And not fully understanding how addiction works, so like not all family members will understand addiction recovery um, or understand like the just how much better the family can be through the recovery process, then family members may actually despair that their relationships will never ever be right. And as they experience the the loved one going off to recovery meetings, making phone calls, calling supports, mentors, whatever the case may be, the partner, the loved one may feel left out of the process and fearful of the new barriers that seem to be encouraging separation rather than support or connection. And stage five, acceptance. This stage is inevitable provided that the the person who is addicted stays in recovery and that partners begin to join the process. So loved ones, family members also focus on their own recovery. So for the addicted person in the acceptance stage, at this stage, they can now begin to see that there's a path of recovery for them, which others have followed successfully. And they they can see that there's hope for their recovery and not only for recovery, but for a life that is better than they ever had before. And for family members in the acceptance stage, they can now again begin to see light at the end of the tunnel. They're now beginning to be become informed and involved in the recovery process through their own support groups, therapy, and self-education. And they're beginning to redefine their roles um, with their addicted partner, their addicted loved ones. In this slide, I just recommend that you take some time to think about and or write down how each of the stages of grief have affected you thus far and where you are in your grieving process. And I give you just some um, statements here on what is really the thought process behind each stage. So in stage one, denial is typically that thought of this can't be happening Um, And stage two, anger, we go to why is this happening to me? And in stage three, it's I'll do anything to change this. Stage four is what's the point of going on after this? And in stage five, it's I know what it is. I can't change it. Now I need to cope. And when we say I can't change it, it means I can't change the fact that I'm experiencing this addiction or that my loved one is experiencing this addiction, but I can change um, in order to recover. I can make the changes. I can learn how to cope, not just cope with this situation, but learn ways in which 
I can change in order to support not only myself and my own growth and change, but my loved one and the entire family. So what are some ways in which you can cope in a healthy way to with the grieving process. There are many things that you can do to help work through your sadness and grief. And there are clear steps you can take to move forward during this difficult time. Some of the following tips are helpful to anyone who is grieving, not just people who are grieving from addiction recovery, but people who are grieving, um, for for any circumstance, whether that's um, addiction recovery, the loss of self, the loss of a way of life, it can be um, help to cope the death of a loved one, the death of a, an animal, the the loss of a job, the a relationship, whatever the case may be. These these suggestions, these uh, ways to cope, will be helpful for anyone who is experiencing grief. So number one is to acknowledge your emotions. It's okay to grieve. Give yourself, give yourself um, permission to grieve. It's okay to be sad. You don't have to push your feelings down. That's actually um, not going to be healthy for you. So if you feel like crying, like don't be afraid to cry, allow yourself to cry, feel everything in spite of the pain. In doing so, you will allow yourself to work through your grief and move forward from there. So feel your feelings. And and for for those that, you know, um, have been struggling with active addiction for quite a while, the, the ability to feel our feelings can be quite challenging. But um, feeling your feelings and allowing yourself to cry and not trying to suppress those emotions is how you're going to move forward. And it's, it's the first step in coping with the grieving process. Number two, number two is to be creative. Use creative outlets to work through your feelings. This can be very, this is very healthy and can be very uplifting. So whether you draw, paint, sculpt, build, design, play music, write, using your creative mind to develop personal expression is a great way to move through difficult times using your mind together with your body. Number three, pray and or meditate. So whether you're religious or not, uh, quiet periods of contemplation can be just what you need during this difficult time. Consider visiting a church or other place of worship if if this is the way in which you choose to practice your faith. But there are many, many other ways in which you can practice your spirituality and practice your, your faith. So whether that's stepping out into a quiet spot in nature to commune with silence and, and deep, clear thought, you may find that quieting your mind helps you to further understand the true nature of the universe and will help you to gain strength. Number four, volunteer your time. There's no better way to help yourself than by helping others. In addition to helping others, you'll be keeping yourself busy by doing something good. Volunteering is a great way to give back to your community and it's a great way to meet like-minded people. Number five, focus on your health. Taking care of yourself is always important, but when you're dealing with deep and powerful emotions inside, it's even more important to be conscious of the right decisions necessary to keep you physically healthy. Be sure to get lots of sleep and eat healthy in the foods you choose and the amounts and frequency of eating. Keep your exercise routine going as well. It will help to keep you busy and working up a good sweat is always a great outlet for any emotions you're feeling. It provides the endorphin rush, which gives you a natural high. Number six, read encouraging books and articles. Reading other people's stories can vastly help you live through your own experience and their words of encouragement can give you strength or take a family education course like the Resilient Warrior Masterclass, which is going to be launched to the public in January. So if you're interested in that, there's a link in the description that you can click on so that you can leave your email address and you will be alerted when that course has finally been launched. 
you, you're already getting great and productive action to move through your grief and grow in your recovery. Number seven, don't grieve alone. Although some of the things recommended already do include periods of solitude. If you need someone to talk to, definitely reach out and find someone. Connection with others will give your recovery process power and help to, you to move through the grieving process more quickly. Number eight, spend time with other recovering people. So it's going to be helpful to connect with what I call a recovery tribe and surround yourself with other individuals in recovery, whether you're the, the individual you know, recovering or the family member. So be sure to have some strong recovery supports to turn to when the going gets especially rough. Number nine, realize that grief is not a straight line. Grieving has a lot of ups and downs. One day you may, may feel that you're feeling better about things, but then the next day you may wake up and um, feel down and feel like you're right back where you started. And this can go on for days, weeks, or even months. So just be aware of that and have a plan in place for those especially rough days and have people lined up to take your call when you need a shoulder to cry on. Because the grieving process definitely goes goes like hand in hand with the post-acute withdrawal phase. So not only are you going through a grieving process, but you have the, the post-acute withdrawal symptoms as well that are impacting your mind. And these are good. It's good that your mind, post-acute withdrawal is all about your, your brain healing, but it's also very challenging because it causes these symptoms, these symptoms of stress and anxiety and loss of sleep. And um, so, so that can compound the already existing grieving process. So just being aware that these, these suggestions will not only help you with your grieving process, but they're going to also help you with the post-acute withdrawal stage as well. So number 10, Work one-on-one -on -one with a counselor or, or therapist who specializes in addiction. Individual therapy can and will help you make a plan for difficult times and help you find more ways to cope with the changes and the challenges of recovery in a healthy and productive way. Counselors who specialize in addiction, and especially those who are in recovery themselves, can do more for you in many ways than a friend. They know what to say and how and when to say it and can offer a non-judgmental environment for grief, loss, anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, hopelessness, and so on. They can help you reframe your issues in a healthy way and give you suggestions on how to move forward. And I have one additional added bonus tip. Count your blessings. And this is all about gratitude. And this may be hard at first. I, I know it was for me. Um, but focusing on the things in your life that you're grateful for will absolutely help you to move through any negative emotions. In fact, I advise that not only do you focus on what you have that you're grateful for, but I also recommend that you start to focus on all of the, the gains, all of the things that you're going to get, that you're going to acquire from your recovery. So while it's absolutely important to be aware of and recognize the impact of the grieving process based on all the losses and the changes that you're experiencing, at the same time, we often lose sight or don't even consider all of the restoration and the gains that you're going to achieve as the result of your recovery. So start to think about those and focus on those and all of the things that you do have to be grateful for. And finally, the last part of this, this last slide here is all about hope because it's a common misconception um, by many people that ending active addiction and the recovery process is, is going to produce immediate relief and positive benefits for all. When in fact, the truth is, is that recovery is a lengthy and long process, which often can bring painful emotions and circumstantial 
realities forward in the early stages before the more comforting and feel-good benefits take place. This is painful and it's difficult, but I can guarantee you that by continuing to move forward, you absolutely will get to that, that point where the relief and the positive benefits will come. But it just, it takes time for most people. And I can tell you for me that it it took a good year and a half before I started to actually experience those, those benefits, those positive rewards from my recovery process. Because for me, what happened is that I, my life and the unmanageability and the consequences had built up to an avalanche. And so, so when I entered into recovery, the avalanche started to slide, you know, all those things started to come to the forefront. And I had a lot of things that I needed to face and a lot of difficulties. And so that took time. It took time to start to face all of those responsibilities and all of the the uh, the wreckage that that I had created, so it definitely took a long time, and I like to also you know use the analogy which I've I've used before in other videos of the person who you know goes to the hospital. Say you know somebody gets into a car accident and they go to the hospital, and you know just like treatment centers, hospitals based upon insurance, you know, want to get people out as quickly as possible. And so when the person that gets hit by uh, a car or, you know, use anything, you can use any illness as an example. But what I like about this hus- this um, car accident is that people will leave and, you know, maybe they'll be in a wheelchair, or they'll have a cast on their arm or on their leg, and we can physically see their, their injury, you know, whereas with addiction, you don't physically see the injury. The injury is in the brain. And so when individuals leave treatment, a lot of time family members and even the individual themselves think, oh, okay, I'm good. I feel good. I feel better. I'm ready to go. And they don't understand um, or fully understand the amount of rehabilitation that still exists, that still is necessary for that individual before they're going to be strong in their recovery. And so because we don't see it, you know, we often treat the person as if, okay, you're ready to jump back into work. You're ready to jump back into the family responsibilities when that is not the case. Will it be the case? Absolutely. But there's still so much work to be done. And so as I tell everybody, the recovery process for the flip to take place where the person is really back to their, um, you know, back to, I say back to where it's really like, you know, you're not even going back, you're creating this whole new, you know, lifestyle. But it takes about a year and a half to really get to that point where where you're feeling very, very strong in, in your recovery and you're at less of a risk of, of relapse from certain people, places, and things. So just having a healthy respect for the power of the addiction and being sure that you are aware of this grieving process, aware of the length of time that it does take to recover. But the good news is, is that you will recover and that you you and your family can be better than you ever were before the addiction took place. Recovery changes everything and it changes it ultimately for the better. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope you found that information to be beneficial. And I just want to give a really quick shout out to my comment challenge winner from last week's video, and that's King Furious. King Furious, thank you so much for supporting my channel and for leaving me a comment. And not just for me, but for others, because the comments really do help other people. So leave me a comment on this video if you found it helpful and also what your experience has been with the grieving process in recovery from addiction. And I hope to see you again next week. In the meantime, I wish you a very beautiful and a blessed week. Namaste.